from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Good morning and welcome to this week's Face the State. I'm John Shearer. March 5th marked the 10th anniversary of the downtown Bozeman explosion. It claimed the life of one person, Tara Bowman, and injured at least one other person. It caused eight businesses in the 200 block of Bozeman's Main Street to close. The blast destroyed or damaged apartments and damaged businesses up and down the street. We spoke with a dozen people who were there, owned an affected business, was a first responder, or was a public official at the time. We sat down in the meeting room of First Security Bank on the main street across from the Bozeman explosion site. We begin with former mayor Jeff Krause. You know, I, what I remember from the morning was just the fear about the loss of life. You know, we were so worried how many people we couldn't get in touch with, the idea of the people driving by, uh, you know, and, and that's what I remember uh, primarily was as the, we found people, you know, the relief as we found people and then the disappointment and sorrow when one person turned up uh, to be a fatality. That, that, that's what I remember about the morning. What, what did you think was going to be, you know, what was your worst case scenario? What, what did you think you were going to be dealing with? Well, at first I think we had 12 or 14 people missing. And um, I didn't know if that included people we didn't know about that were just driving by. Because this would, you know, it was 8.30 something and it was going to uh, be right there during morning drive time. and. People were going to be stopped at a light, and the way it blew out, we just thought people walking by, people in uh, inside the buildings. I'm sure my worst case scenario was that several of those people that we couldn't find right away were going to have been killed. As the day went on, and it took 15 hours to shut off the gas, and um, you know, more and more people were coming in. What was going on with city government? Well, there, there were some uh, amazing things uh, uh, that were going on. You know, we dumped a couple million gallons of water on the site, and so we had to fully involve the Public Works Department, the Water Department. We were emptying the tank at a, at a great rate, and then all of the responders, uh, mutual aid responders from around the county were showing up. Uh, um, the uh, public works director, Debbie Arkell at the time, was uh, organizing her crews uh, so that they started from the other end and they were helping board up the windows and just make sure the, the, that the buildings were safe for someone to come in before they were boarded up. Because uh, for a while there, there were a number of buildings no one could go in. Uh, we were responding to questions from other business owners, particularly the ones right down here. Uh, uh, what was going on? Uh, those were, the, I think, those were the key things, um, and you know, a, a little bit of concern that it might spread, but I think we, you know, and it did spread some, right? It spread to uh, the, the the what I think is the next building to the east, and and eventually that had to be taken down as well. So there was some worry about the block itself, and then we. But I think the, the, what I remember was, uh, uh, of course, the, um, the concerns about the lives um, and then the concerns uh, 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 of the business owners and because it, uh, the blast wave bounced down the street and blew out the windows in opposite sides of the streets as it bounced. And that was a, uh, 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 a phenomenon I don't think anybody was prepared for. Uh, but, you know, how far it went and how many buildings were damaged, what the amount of damage that was. You think about these buildings are very old down here and they're just brick masonry walls and did it affect the Baxter? Did it affect the Bozeman Hotel? Um, did the fa front facades of some of these buildings, were they structurally impaired? Uh, so the building department was fully involved. This was uh, uh, very much a team effort by the city of Bozeman. And then as the day went on, it became a team effort for the people of Bozeman as people showed up and brought food and, and uh, supplies and volunteered to help. 
Um, and that, that essentially that's what I did manning the phones was people calling and saying, can we drop something off? Can we, how, what can we do to help? I saw, I heard a lot of that, those kinds of questions, uh, just manning the, the, the phones in City Hall. Afterward, um, you know, kind of after the day and the first few days gets, uh, gets by us, did you find that people were apprehensive about coming back downtown? I, I didn't. I did not find that at all. And what I found were the business owners and the property owners anxious to fix their windows and open their doors. And, uh, you know, I, I talk about, I mean, I think we talk about the, the loss of life, the first responders and how well they did, the way the city pulled together. And then I think the biggest thing that, that impressed me were, were the first replacers, the people that came in right away and said, you know, we've lost our businesses, we've lost our buildings, uh, and yet we want to get started. When can we get started uh, rebuilding? And that happened almost immediately. Of course, there was some time where insurance companies and, and all of the, the principals involved had to get together, but, uh, you know, there was an immediate reaction to when can we replace? And, and as you know, the first replacers, the very first people to come back in and build a building were, were uh, the American Legion. And, and that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. These are the guys that are trained to run towards the sound of gunfire. And I think that for, that for them to run in and plant the flag in Bozeman um, on the, in the center of that destruction and to come out and say, we want to get started right away, set the tone for um, how Bozeman was going to move forward from this. There are a lot of towns where the, that don't recover from these large explosions or they have vacant lots. Um, you cannot underestimate um, what it means to have someone come in right away and say, we're rebuilding. And of course that happened with the businesses, that happened with the customers, um, that happened with everybody. This is uh, valuable to, this is the heart of town. and. Uh, and it was beating strongly immediately after the explosion. Why was it that you decided to go right back in that same spot? I mean, you could have moved down Main Street farther. <sighs> we could have, but the thing about it was, then we're, we're starting from ground zero. At least we had a piece of ground that was ours and we could, we could go. I mean, we, we can immediately start. If we were gonna go to another building, it would have been another month or two delay in doing the processing of purchasing the property and going through all of that and then starting again. So most of the board meant, well, we all agreed, the majority agreed that, hey, let's just stay right where we're at and go for it. How, uh, how how difficult was it for you to get that going that fast? I mean, did you have government or, you know, like, who had to give you the permits to, you know, were there roadblocks? Was that oh, yeah. hard to do? Oh, oh yeah, there, there was plenty of roadblocks, but again, we had, we had a great um, um, group that was heading up the building committee and they knew all the ins and outs and who to go talk to if this didn't work or who not to go talk to and all that kind of stuff. So if we got delayed a little bit with something, then we went in and we said, no, we got to get going and we got the process going. So there was some roadblocks and some stumbling blocks along the way, but we worked right through them and we just, we just kept on putting the gas pedal down and saying, we're, we're going, we're going, we're going. And we got to get this thing up and going, so we did. And so the women's, uh, Republican women's of uh, Gallatin County, they bought us, we, lo we lost everything, and we lost all of our flags, we lost, that we put up on Main Street all the time mm -hmm. for different uh, special days. And well, we lost all our memorabilia, we lost all our chart, we lost everything. And um, so they said, can we buy you new flags? We said, yeah, thank you. So they bought us all brand 89 new flags. So, and then one of the elect, uh, electrical companies said, 
will provide you with rigid conduit for your poles for your flags. So they donated all of those and hooked those all up for us. It was like, wow, where are all these people coming from? And other, other places around here, they all said, what can we do to help? And they, some of them gave us money, some of them, you know, just got us whatever, you know, we could use. And it, it was a great awakening for, because we were pretty quiet back. We did our little veterans thing and that was, that was pretty much it. We weren't actively in the community, but now we are. And it's because the community stepped up to us that we stepped back to them. So it was a great marriage, actually. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about uh, your manager who was in the building when the explosion happened? Oh, Tom, yeah. Um, he always... Um, his ritual was at 8 in the morning, or a little bit before, he'd drive his vehicle in, back through the alleyway and check our back door and the back of our building and check to see how much trash might be out there, how much he had to go out back and clean up or whatever. And as he's driving through, he smelled natural gas. So he said, well, of course, that's not right. And so he drove around and parked in front like he normally does and went downstairs and dialed 9-1. And as soon as he was ready to hit one again, kaboom, and knocked him on his back. And then he heard the rumble from upstairs from because that was the basement. And then we had another story and another story. So that was all collapsing in. And he heard the rumble. He said, it sounded like an earthquake. You know, but he said, I didn't know what it was, but I didn't like the sound. And he said, I got the heck out of there. So he didn't finish the call, just got up, went up, crawled up the stairs, got outside, and a fireman was running down the street towards him, still putting his jacket on. And he said, are you all right? He said, yeah. He said, get over to the fire station. And then, the, then all of the first responders were there. So, and uh, that's when it started burning and more collapsing and so on and so forth. But he made it out okay and his, his truck was parked out front and it got a little bit of damage but seemed like it kind of went kind of went around him <laughs> a little bit. So it wasn't too badly damaged. So You talked about um, this tragedy uh, bringing you back to the community. How's that work now, uh, this like community of the 200 block and the greater community of Bozeman? Yeah, we're all one big big family now. It's, uh, it's, it, it, we, we never paid any attention to our neighbors before, and it was kind of amazing, but now it's like, you know, everybody helps us, we help them. It's just a, a great big family now. It's a, it's a, it was a great awakening. What was happening for you before the blast? I was stationed out at Station 2, which is off of 19th there, and we were out shoveling snow. Um, and it was interesting because it didn't come over our radios or our pagers. It was basically um, another fi our fire, another captain was down at Station 1 and actually heard the blast and called out on just the regular telephone and said, hey, we have some type of blast, you want to start heading this way. So that's kind of how our day started. So you're, you're heading in, did you feel it at all where you were over no, there? No, no, we were outside, didn't feel it. And then I was trying to get confirmation just because we, we were going in basically blind. We didn't have any information. It was just some sort of explosion or blast. And so as we were driving, I remember turning on Main Street um, and heading down and then you could kind of see um, the explosion or um, the smoke rising and everything and that's when we were trying to put it all together. So what's the first thing that goes through your mind when you round that corner and see it? <laughs> it was really um, surreal and what I mean by that is as we got closer like two or three blocks out you could start debris was in the air and was falling down and it um, people were standing there were people standing on the sidewalks I remember them everyone was kind of dazed because nobody really knew what was going on. And it really felt like, um, it reminded me a lot sort of of the shots that you would see at 9-11 on a smaller scale in terms of 
there was just debris and um, smoke and everything and glass was all over in the in the roadway and um, we were trying to figure out okay where exactly is this and what do we have right right did you at that time know that it had been a gas explosion no um, initially I was thinking um, some type of bomb and really more terrorist is what I was thinking um, just because we don't have explosions like this I mean I've never in my career we'd never gone on an explosion of that magnitude and so it really didn't but we've been trained and then during that time from 9-11 uh, a lot of our training coming out of that was weapons of mass destruction so it was kind of um, I guess cognitively in the back of my brain thinking about that so that's kind of what I was thinking was there was some major bomb that went off or someone you know somebody set out harm and so that was kind of what I was thinking when I was trying to process everything. We also spoke with people at the Rocking R Bar which was rebuilt on the blast site. Would you have had people here? What, what was your, your first reaction there? Yeah, the, the, the cleaners or, or, or the bit bookkeeper would have been, we wouldn't have had staff here at that, that early in the morning, but they could have been here. And the snow slowed everybody up and adjusted people's schedules a little bit. So that, that was a blessing in disguise in all re reality. I've heard other people talk about that, the fact that it was a day not unlike the day that's going on here right now, Correct. Um, almost 10 years later. Um, so how, talk, talk to me a little bit about that snow and, and how that affected life on this block that morning. Yeah, I think it slowed everybody up. There was, it wasn't a ton of snow, but there was enough snow that everybody was probably 35 minutes, 40 minutes behind where they normally would be. Um, and there'd normally be more people going up and down Main Street or parking in front of the, the bar at that time in the morning. But there was just enough snow that it slowed everybody up. And that window when the explosion happened, there wasn't as many people down here as there normally would have been. Oh, wow. And did you get to talk to some people who did happen to be in the area at the time? Uh, yeah, I've talked to, there were several people. Uh, Tom Jones, who ran the Legion at the time, was actually in the, the basement of the Legion, if I remember correctly. I think he got knocked to the, the floor uh, when the explosion happened and was completely surprised. I'll bet, I'll bet. And there was a bank meeting going on across the street, too. I think they had a board of directors meeting going on. And at that time, First Security was under a uh, big remodel and reconstruction. They had a big construction walkway covering the whole front side of the building. Well, those used to all be windows and that's where their board meeting was. Thank God that construction walkway was there because it prevented the, the debris from blowing into the bank. And I, I got a feeling those windows would have blown out at that time if, if that wouldn't have been there. Mm. So you, you're coming downtown, you finally get down here and you probably didn't know what to expect on the way when you saw the front uh, or, or the, the block, this part of the block, what did you think? I was just, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was almost like a war zone, to be honest with you. There wasn't people everywhere, but the destruction was so bad and, and it was surreal, to be honest with you. You know, a funny story is at that point in my life, I didn't even have a cell phone. And my wife was always after me to get a cell phone. <laughs> I borrowed her that cell phone that morning from her, and I never gave it back to her. <laughs> so I've, I've used her cell phone and that number ever since that day. Wow. And did you, did you have any thoughts right away about, about how you would react to this, what you would do, what would happen with the business? You know, I, I think the first thought was to make sure everybody was okay. Um, then the next thought was, uh, hopefully the firemen and all the public safety people were okay. And that night after, I'd say probably about six o'clock at night, we had Ferraro's Italian restaurant at the time. We went over to the restaurant and the outpouring of public support immediately was unbelievable. The lounge all filled up with impromptu of people that we knew came down wanting to know how we could help you. Uh, we got a call from the governor uh, mid-morning saying anything he needed he could help uh, our local politicians were all on board and we, that that morning everybody was for Bozeman and not for themselves that's for sure it's such a shock 
that it is hard to put two and two together. You don't, you're not looking at it as logically as you might later. But um, it was just, you know, you just kind of knew at that moment that life as you know it had changed forever. You didn't know why, but you knew that things were different. At what point did Tara come up? Tara didn't come up for a little while, um, probably a couple hours in, because at that point that I knew, I had figured out that the gallery, you know, the news had traveled enough and I was able to deduce that the gallery had gone as well. So then I was trying to find Steve because I know, you know, Tara, Steve, everybody at the gallery. And so I was trying to find him to make sure that he was okay and he was looking for Tara. So then I was like, oh my God. And he said, have you, have you heard, have you seen her? Has, you know, and I said, no, I haven't, but I'll, I'll start looking right now too. You know, I'm sure she's fine. Let's just, you know, one step at a time. But you could tell that we were both, you know, had this kind of weird feeling of hope to God she's okay, you know, but she just was the only part that none of us could really account for. But there was so much chaos that we weren't really like mm -hmm. drawing any conclusions either. At what point did did you really start to get worried? Because it, it was several days, actually, what, two days? But toward the end of the first day, <clears throat> we I kind of started to have a sinking feeling because no one had heard from her. And we all, there was a, a lot of us that were in the Bikram um, yoga community and Tara was an everyday yoga attendant. So mm. that's where I went next. I was like calling the studio, like, have you guys, has, did, was Tara at class today? Um, you know, and nobody had seen her, but again. What are your memories of Tara? Uh, Anybody that knew Tara would say that she probably had the prettiest smile of anybody that you've ever met. Um, just very positive, glowing. Um, she was very much a quiet part of the glue to downtown. She wasn't, she was just quiet and graceful, but everyone knew Tara and everybody had some, something special to say about her, whether they knew her well or not. And I felt like she was such, she just brought light everywhere she, everywhere, she, up and down Main Street. And to all those that knew her, um, everyone loved her. Everyone had, you know, nothing but kindness before and after this to say about her. And uh, I mean, she was a very inspiring woman and still is to this day. At, uh at that point where you were able to clear your kind of your your backlog or your list of missing people and and get it down to one by the end of the day early on into the evening of the day of the explosion we realized Tara was the only person that was most probably lost we couldn't account for her. Uh, family members knew where she was uh, at the time that the explosion occurred and there was no way for us to get our detectives or the fire crews into that area uh, from the very first moment that we responded, there was no way to get to her. And that, that's the part that's still hard uh, for all of us, knowing the family suffered a loss. We're very thankful nobody else was injured or lost, but we lost one person of our community. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that always weighs heavy on us. When we started the investigation, uh, there was so much debris. We, we had a hard time locating the footprint of the building where we eventually found her. We did a lot of work into another building, it turns out, before we realized we were too far east uh, and, and finally located the building of Trails Gallery. We were able to recover her for her family. Hmm. Do you think the weather uh, played a role, perhaps, in preventing further injuries or deaths that day? I have to believe it did, because driving uh, from the Law and Justice Center to downtown, Code 3 was pretty scary in by itself because of how slippery it was. Uh, but downtown, every, I think everybody was late getting moving that morning, much like today. Very icy, very, very slippery roads, and I think people were, were not walking downtown like you might have seen uh, on any given day. Some of the businesses that we thought would have people in it uh, didn't have anybody at work at that time. So I'm thankful for the snow. Probably prevented further injury or death. You know, what would you have seen as, as a worst case scenario? I mean, as you're, as you're coming down Main Street trying to get there, what, what are you thinking? 
And I was thinking that we we're going to have multiple injuries, multiple fatalities, both within the buildings and out on Main Street. Now, there was traffic on Main Street and how no vehicles got uh, damaged, no people got injured. Earlier in the day, in between all of this breaking news and what we're trying to put on the air and doing extra shows, we were invited to Tara Restat Bowman's mother's home and the family was there and you and I dashed out in the middle of the afternoon when we were still trying to put together shows and that was just awful. It was just awful. To, I can still see that house sitting in that living room and that family gathered around her and she seemed to me to be just so in shock and so dazed and devastated and I was fighting back tears trying to be professional and knowing that we were intruding on one of the the most devastating times of her life we wanted to get the story we didn't want to be intrusive and it's a fine line to try and get a story and to help people understand but to have somebody's pain like that as a mother to a mother I wanted to just weep with her and, and you can't and I knew I had all this other to get done and you want to be professional but it was awful for her and she was suffering suffering so and I'm just even to this day you know ten years later how how difficult it must have been for her those those of us who have children it's it's hard to even let yourself go there as a mother to even think of losing your child even though Tara was in her 30s they're they're always your baby they're always your baby and we were there and they were so strong and she was in so much shock she said I something to the effect I can still hear her saying something to the effect of I'm not sure how I'll go on from this and I thought to myself I don't know how you do I don't know how you do go on from that very very difficult it was probably the one thing that stands out to me the most on that day was being with them and I think I was probably a little too shy to tell her that I would pray for her I don't remember that accurately enough to mm -hmm. say but I certainly was praying for her and the whole family you know I mean there were a lot of people there that that were struggling and it's so it's so shocking to have something like that happen so abrupt and so shocking and to lose a person like that they're here and they're gone mm -hmm. thank you for joining us today on face the state for a look back at the bozeman explosion from 10 years ago i'm john shearer enjoy the rest of your sunday you've been watching face the state a presentation of mtn the montana television network